On the Banks of Plum Creek, Chapter 16, The Wonderful House. The creek went down. All at once, the days were warm, and early every morning, Pa went to work the wheat field with Sam and David, the Christmas horses. I declare, Ma said, you're working that ground to death, and you're killing yourself, Charles. But Pa said the ground was dry because there had not been enough snow. He must plow deep and harrow well and get the wheat sowed quickly. Every day he was working before the sun came up and he worked until dark. Laura waited in the dark until she heard Sam and David splashing into the ford. Then she ran to the dugout for the lantern and she hurried to the stable to hold it so Pa could see to his chores. He was too tired to laugh or talk. He ate supper and went straight to bed. At last, the wheat was sowed. Then he sowed oats, and he made the potato patch and the garden. Ma and Mary and Laura helped plant the potatoes and sprinkle little seed in, seeds in the garden rows, and they let Carrie think she was helping. The whole world was green with grass now. The yellow-green willow leaves were uncurling. Violets and buttercups were thick in the prairie hollows, and clove-like leaves and lavender blossoms were sour and good to eat. Only the wheat field was bare and brown. One evening, Pa showed Laura a faint green mist on the brown field. The wheat was up. Each tiny sprout was so thin you could hardly see it, but many of them all together made that misty green. Everyone was happy that night because the wheat was a good stand. The next day, Pa drove to town. Sam and David could, could go to town and come back in one afternoon. There was hardly time to even miss Pa, and they were not even watching out for him when he came home. Laura heard the wagon first, and she was the first one up the path. Pa was sitting up on the wagon seat. His face was one big shining of joy, and lumber was piled high in the wagon box behind him. He sang out, here's your new house, Caroline. But Charles, Ma gasped. Laura ran and climbed over the wheel up onto that pile of boards. She had never seen such smooth, straight, beautiful boards. They had been sawed by machinery. But the wheat's hardly up yet, Ma said. That's all right, Pa told her. They let me have the lumber and we'll pay for it when we sell the wheat. Laura asked, are we going to have a house made of boards? Yes, Flutter Budget, said Pa. We're going to have a whole house build of sawed lumber, and it's going to have glass windows. It was really true. Next morning, Mr. Nelson came to help Pa, and they began digging the cellar for the house. They were going to have that wonderful house just because the wheat was growing. Laura and Mary could hardly stay in the dugout long enough to do their work, but Ma made them do it again. And I won't have you giving your work a lick and a promise, said Ma. So they washed every breakfast dish and put them all away. They made their beds neatly. They brushed the floor with a willow twig broom and set the broom back in its place. Then they could go. They ran down the steps and over the footbridge and under the willows and up to the prairie. They went through the prairie grasses and up to the top of the green knoll where Pa and Mr. Nelson were building the new house. It was fun to watch them set up the skeleton house. The timber stood up slender and gold new, and the sky was very blue between them. The hammers made a gay sound. The planes cut long, curly shavings from the sweet-smelling boards. Laura and Mary hung little wood shavings over their ears for earrings. Then they put them around their necks for necklaces. Laura tucked long ones in her hair, and they hung down in golden curls, just the color she always wanted her hair to be. Up on the skeleton roof, Pa and Mr. Nelson hammered and sawed. Little blocks of wood fell down, and Laura and Mary gathered them into piles and built little houses of their own. They never had such a good time. Pa and Mr. Nelson covered the skeleton walls with slanting boards nailed on. They shingled the roof with shingles, boughten. Boughten shingles were thin and all the same size. They were far finer than the shingles Pa could make with his ax. They made for an even tight roof with not one crack in it. Then Pa laid the floor of silky smooth boards that were grooved along the edges and fitted together perfectly. 
Overhead, he laid another floor for the upstairs, and that made the ceiling of the downstairs. Across the downstairs, Pa put up a partition. The house was going to have two rooms. One was the bedroom and the other was to live in. He put two shiny clear glass windows in that room, one looking toward the sunrise and the other beside the door to the south. In the bedroom walls, he set two more windows and they were glass windows too. Laura had never seen such wonderful windows. They were in halves. There were six panes of glass in each half and the bottom half would push up and stay open when a stick was put under it. The opposite the front door, Pa put a back door and outside it, he built a tiny room. That was a lean to because it leaned against the house. It would keep out north winds in the winter time. And it was a place where Ma could keep her broom and mop and wash tub. Now Mr. Nelson was not there and Laura asked questions all the time. Pa said the bedroom was for Ma and Carrie and him. He said the attic was for Mary and Laura to sleep in and play in. Laura wanted so much to see it that he stopped working on the lean-to and nailed strips of board up the wall to make their attic ladder. Laura skipped quickly up the ladder until her head came through the hole in the attic floor. The attic was as big as both rooms were downstairs. Its slanting roof was the underside of the fresh yellow shingles. There was a little window at each end of the attic and those windows were made of glass. At first, Mary was scared to swing off the ladder to the attic floor. Then she was scared to step down through the hole, floor hole onto the ladder. Laura felt scared too, but she pretended she didn't. And as soon as they got used, and soon they got used to getting on and off the ladder. Now they thought the house was done, but Pa nailed black tar paper all over the outside of the house walls. Then he nailed more boards over the paper. They were long, smooth boards, one lapping over the other, up all the sides of the house. Then around the windows and the doors, Pa nailed flat frames. This house is tight as a drum, he said. There was not one single crack in the roof or the walls or the, or the floor of that house to let in any rain or cold winds. Then Pa put in doors and they were bought in doors. They were smooth and far thinner than slab doors he had hewed with his ax. And even thinner panels were set into them above and below their middles. The hinges were bought in two, and it was marvelous to see those hinges open and shut. They did not rattle like the wooden hinges Pa made or let the door drag like leather hinges. Into those doors, Pa set the locks that he had bought too, and the bought and locks had little keys that went into small shaped holes and turned and clicked. The locks had white china doorknobs. Then one day, Pa said, Laura and Mary, can you keep a secret? Oh, yes, Polly said. Promise you won't tell Ma? He asked, and they promised. He opened the lean-to door, and there stood a shiny black cook stove. Pa had bought it from town and hidden it there to surprise Ma. And there's the cook stove. On top, the cook stove had four round holes and four round lids fitted there. Each lid had a grooved hole in it and there was an iron handle that fitted into the holes to lift the lid. In front, there was a long, low door. There were slits in the door, so a piece of iron would slide back and forth to close or open the slits. That was the drought. Under it, a shelf like an oblong pan stuck out. That was to catch ashes and to keep the ashes from dropping on the floor. A lid swung flat over this hollowed out shelf and on the lid were raised iron letters in rows. Mary put her finger on the bottom row and spelled out P-A-T-1770. She said to Pa, what does that spell, Pa? It spells Pat, Pa said. Laura opened a big door on the side of the stove and looked at a big square shelf across it. Oh, Pa, what is this for, she asked. It's the oven, Pa told her. He lifted that marvelous stove and set it in the living room and put up the stove pipe. Piece by piece, the stove pipe went up through the ceiling and the attic and through a hole that he sawed in the roof. Then Pa climbed onto the roof and he set a larger tin pipe over the stove pipe. 
The tin pipe had a spread out flat bottom that covered the hole in the roof. Not a drop of rain could run down the stove pipe into the new house. And that was a prairie chimney. Well, it's done, Pa said, even to a prairie chimney. So there was nothing more that a house could possibly have. The glass windows made the inside of that house so light you could hardly know you were in a house. It smelled clean and piney from the yellow new board and walls and floor. The cook stove stood in the corner by the lean-to. A touch on the white china doorknob swung the bottom door open and the bottom hinges and the doorknob and the little iron tongue clicked and held the door shut. We shall move in tomorrow, Pa said. This is the last night we sleep in a dugout. Laura and Mary took hands and they went down the knoll. The wheat field was a silky shimmering green rippling over a curve of the prairie. Its sides were straight and its corners were square and all around it the wild, wild prairie grasses looked coarser and darker green. Laura looked back at the wonderful house. In the sunshine on the knoll its sawed lumber walls and roof were as golden as a straw stack. So I think the letters um, are the pattern for that kind of a stove, because it spells out P-A-T. And a patent is when you invent something, you get um, credit for it so that everybody knows you invented it. Okay, chapter 17 is called Moving In. In the sunny morning, Ma and Laura helped carry everything from the dugout up to the top of the bank and loaded in the wagon. Laura hardly dared look at Pa, but they were bursting with a secret surprise for Ma. Ma did not suspect anything. She took the hot ashes out of the old stove so that Pa could handle it. She asked Pa, did you remember to get more stovepipe? Yes, Caroline, Pa said. Laura did not laugh, but she choked a little. <clears throat> Goodness, Laura, Ma said, have you got a frog in your throat? David and Sam hauled the wagon away across the ford and back over the prairie up to the new house. Ma and Mary and Laura with armfuls of things and Carrie, toddling ahead of them, went over the footbridge and up the grassy path. They saw the sawed lumber house with its boughten shingle roof was all golden and Pa jumped off the wagon and waited to be with Ma when she saw the cook stove. She walked into the house and stopped short. Her mouth opened and shut. And then she said weakly, my land. Laura and Mary whooped and danced and so did Carrie, though she did not know why. It's yours, Ma, they shouted. It's your new cook stove, they shouted. And it's got an oven and it's got four lids and a little handle and it's got letters on it and I can read them. P-A-T, Pat. Oh, Charles, said Ma. You shouldn't have. Pa hugged her. Don't you worry, Caroline, he told her. I never have worried, Charles, Ma answered. But building such a house and glass windows and buying a stove, oh, it's too much. Nothing is too much for you, said Pa. And don't you worry about the expense. Just look through that glass at that wheat field. But Laura and Mary pulled her to the cook stove. She lifted the lids as Laura showed her how. She watched while Mary worked the drought. She looked at the oven. My, I don't even know if I dare try get dinner on such a big, beautiful stove. But she did get dinner on that wonderful stove, and Mary and Laura set the table in the bright, airy room. The glass windows were open, air and light came in from every side, and sunshine was streaming in the house through the doorway and shining, window, and shining in the window beside it. It was such fun to eat in that big, airy, light house, <clears throat> that after dinner, they sat at the table just enjoying being there. Now, this is something like, Pa said. Then they put up curtains. Glass windows must have curtains, said Ma, and she made them out of pieces of worn out sheets, and she starched them crisp and white as snow, and she edged them with narrow strips of pretty calico. The curtains in the big room were edged with pink stripes from Carrie's little dress that had been torn when the oxen ran away. The bedroom curtains were edged with strips from Mary's old blue dress. That was the pink calico and the blue calico that Pa had brought home from town long, long ago when they lived in the big woods. 
While Pa was driving nails to hold the strings for the curtains, Ma brought out two long strips of brown wrapping paper that she had saved. She folded them and she showed Mary and Laura how to cut tiny bits out of the folded paper with scissors. When each unfolded the paper, there was a row of stars. She spread the paper on the shelves behind the stove. The stars hung over the edges of the shelves and the light shone through them. When the curtains were up, Ma hung two snowy clean sheets across a corner of the bedroom. That made a nice place where Pa and Ma could hang their clothes. Up in the attic, Ma put another sheet that Mary and Laura could hang their clothes behind. The house was beautiful when Ma had finished. The pure white curtains were looped back on each side of the clear glass windows. Between those pink edged snowy curtains, the sunshine streamed in. The walls were all clean, the piney smelling boards with the skeleton of the house against them and the ladder going up to the attic. The cook stove and the stove pipe were glossy black in that corner with the starry shelves. Ma spread between the meals red checkered cloth on the table and on it she set the shiny clean lamp. She laid there the paper covered Bible and the big green Wonders of the Animal World book and the novel named Millbank. The two benches stood neatly by the table. The last thing, Pa hung the bracket on the wall by the front window and Ma stood the little china shepherdess upon it. And I think there's a picture of that. Let me see if I can find it. This is Ma's little china that she takes with her to all the different places they live. So he made a little wall for that. <clears throat> that was the wooden brown bracket that Pa had carved with stars and vines and flowers for Ma as a Christmas present long ago. That was the same smiling shepherdess with golden hair and blue eyes and pink cheeks, her little china bodice laced with china gold ribbons and her little china apron and her little china shoes. She had traveled all the way from the big woods in the Indian Terry and all the territory and all the way to Plum Creek in Minnesota. And there she stood smiling. In the little house in the big woods, she's up on the mantle. Can't totally see her though, because the words are kind of in the way. But it's a little doll made of China. And China as in like really fancy porcelain. Like you might have some china dishes in your house or china teacups. That night, Laura and Mary climbed the ladder and went to bed by themselves in their large, airy, very own attic. They did not have curtains because Ma had no more old sheets, but each had a box to sit upon and each had a box to keep her treasures in. Charlotte and the paper dolls lived in Laura's box and in Mary's quilt blocks and her scrap bag were in. Behind the curtain, each had her nail to take her nightgown off and hang her dress upon. The single thing wrong with that room was that Jack could not climb up the ladder. Laura went to sleep at once. She had been running in and out of the new house and up and down the ladder all day long, but she could not stay asleep. The new house was too still. She missed the sound of the creek singing to her in her sleep. The stillness kept waking her up. At last, it was a sound that opened her eyes. She listened. It was the sound of many, many little feet running about overhead. It seemed to be thousands of little animals scampering on the roof. What could it be? Why, it was raindrops. Laura had not heard rain pattering on the roof for so long that she had forgotten the sound of it. In the dugout, she could not hear the rain. There was so much earth and grass above her. She was happy while she lay drowsingly to sleep again, hearing the pitter-pat, pitter-pat of the rain upon the new roof. Okay, those were good chapters. Imagine building your own house like that. And they're so excited because Pa doesn't have to make every teeny tiny thing. So when they say they got bought in this and bought in that, then that means that they bought them from a store. So they're store-bought items. And um, they function better because they've been made more precisely with like machines and things. So 
Okay, I'll be back and we will start chapter 18 when I come back. Bye for now.